Thank you very much for the introduction. As Eric said, I want to talk about the joint work with Aonam. So at the beginning, let me very quickly remind you why you might want to care about logarithmic lower left inequalities if you don't already. So they are a classical tool to like quantify return to equilibrium. So in the form I'll be using them here, they give you exponential decay of the entropy. So as such, they are useful in mathematical physics, differential geometry, quantum information. Well, arguably that's a part of mathematical physics anyway. And like one distinctive property of logarithmic Sobolev inequalities is that they give you dimension independent bounds. So unlike the usual Sobolev inequalities where you have this dimensional constant, these here are dimension independent. And one way to express this is to say, these satisfy some tensorization property. And before I'm gonna to cut to quantum information, let me focus on the differential geometry part here in the realm of, let's say, classical mathematics or physics, which is um, the connection between logarithmic Sobolev inequalities and Ricci curvature bounds. So that's a rather classical result that if you have a Riemannian manifold, let's say complete, then the heat semi-group satisfies the logarithmic Sobolev inequality with constant 2k if the Ricci curvature of the manifold is bounded below by k. And there's, well, at least two approaches to prove such a result. One of these approaches that relies on optimal transport, and it uses that Ricci curvature bounds of a manifold can be characterized by certain convexity properties of the entropy with respect to the L2 Wasserstein distance. So here the entropy comes into play. So there's also some already some cue why this would have to do with logarithmic Sobolev inequalities. And the second approach is going back to Bakri and Emery. And this relies on the fact that one can use Bogner's identity to characterize Ricci curvature bounds in terms of their gamma and gamma two calculus. And what I want to focus on here is the optimal transport approach. So the whole setting I was giving you here is Riemannian manifolds, differential geometry, but surprisingly, this can be extended to the realms of quantum information. So classically, this result, I think, goes back to the work of Otto and Villani, who proved that for the heat semi-group on a Riemannian manifold, Ricci curvature bounds can be used to imply the logarithmic Sobolev inequality through this optimal transport approach. Then there was work by Jan Maas, Mirke, Chao Li Shu, who proved that one can construct a very similar metric to the L2 Wasserstein metric now for finite graphs to also obtain logarithmic Sobolev inequalities. And then finally, by uh, Eric and Jan, and also mere commitment spike, they could extend these results to quantum Markov semi groups which is what I want to focus on here. So let me shortly describe the setting I'm working in. So the finite dimensional case was already uh, done very satisfyingly in these works I mentioned before. So let's move on to infinite dimensions. So we have a von Neumann algebra M and tau is normal faithful, which is important for us ratio state. So as the basic examples, if you want to think classical, then you can take M and L infinity space and tau just integration with respect to a probability measure, as in the on the previous slide, X might be a compact manifold. Or if you're more interested in quantum information, of course the N by N matrices with the normalized trace give you a good example. 
then the basic object I'm going to work on or work with are quantum Markov semi-groups. So this is a semi-group of UCP maps on M. We need some continuity condition that is in this case weak star continuity. And then what is important for us is that we also have a symmetry condition or some kind of detailed balance as it's called, which in our case is always symmetry with respect to the inner product introduced or induced by this trace. So in the finite dimensional case, we can go even farther. We don't need uh, symmetry with respect to a trace for infinite dimensions. That's where we stand right now. And of course, like as basic examples, think of the heat semi-group on a Riemannian manifold. And then we need one more piece of information, namely the entropy. As there's of course many forms. I think there's a question. Uh, uh, oh, hi. Um, sorry, thanks. Uh, can you go back just one slide? I just had a sure. question about this tau um, symmetry equation. Uh, can you just say motivated uh, some motivation for why one would consider this in the quantum setting? Well, in the quantum setting, if you think of KMS symmetry, this is something like zero KMS symmetry. So it's KMS symmetry at infinite temperature. So in some sense, this describes an open quantum system uh, coupled to an environment which is in equilibrium at infinite temperature. And of course, infinite temperature is not quite physical, but that's what we can do right now. All right, so let me give you the entropy functional we're looking at here. So we've seen already quite a lot of entropy functionals in how Nance talk. Here we used the one with the logarithmic term like tau of rho log rho minus log sigma. And then we say that our QMS satisfies a modified logarithmic Sobolev inequality if lambda times the entropy is bounded above by this term, which is a non commutative version of the Fisher information. And here L is the generator of TT in such a way that it's positive. I think there's always some confusion about signs. And E is the conditional expectation onto the fixed point algebra. So one might want to assume that TT is simply um, a ergodic semi-group and then this C of rho is simply one. But for tensorization properties, it's quite practical to allow for non-ergodic semi-groups. Because like, as I mentioned in the beginning, one of the nice properties of these logarithmic Sobolev inequalities in the classical case is that they are dimension independent, i.e. they tensorize. And in the quantum setting, this is unfortunately not true, but one can as a mathematician, of course, just define it in such a way that it's true. So we say that TT satisfies the complete log or complete modified log Sobolev inequality if TT is tensorized with the identity on an arbitrary ratio of von Neumann algebra satisfies MLSI. And this version of the mod log of mod LSI then tensorizes. Okay. And now for all this game of going from Ritchie curvature bounds of some kind to logarithmic Sobolev inequalities, one key ingredient is always that generators of these gradually symmetric QMS can be written in terms of derivations. 
here in our setting, there's a result to Cipriani and Sovacho is that if I have a tau symmetric QMS, then the generator is of the form D star D, where D is a derivation with values in a bi module over M. So let's look at the very basic um, examples. So if TT is the heat semi-group on a Riemannian manifold, then of course the generator is minus the Laplacian, which is gradient adjoint after gradient. And the gradient, of course, is a derivation. It satisfies the Leibniz rule. But also if you're more inclined towards quantum information, then let's look how the generators uh, look like there. If I have a tau symmetric QMS, then it has a very nice and simple lint platform. Namely, it's a sum of double commutators. And here, these VJ can be chosen to be self adjoint in this form. And then this is, of course, also um, derivation adjoint after derivation, where the derivation is just taking the commutator with VJ and forming this vector. Okay, and now we can form some operators. Like on a Riemannian manifold, there's only one way to multiply a function with a tangent vector. And then there's a very well-defined way to write something like rho psi psi. But here in this general setting, I said this H is a bimodule. So you have a left and a right multiplication with rho. And there's many ways to write something like rho psi rho. And we take one of these ways. So technically, this lambda is an operator mean of the left and the right multiplication with rho. And we define this rho norm. And then we say that our TT satisfies the gradient estimate GE of k infinity if this inequality holds true. So the one very particular case where um, everything is nice, so if lambda of x, y is just y, then the rho norm of psi squared can be expressed by the of dx squared can be expressed by the carré du champ operator. So let me write this properly. <laughs> so in this specific case, we get the classical Bakri Emery criterion back. But for logarithmic Sobolev inequality, unfortunately, we cannot work with this um, right trivial mean. In this case, we need um, the logarithmic mean. So first, one more definition. Once again, we want tensor stability. So we say that TT satisfies CGE of K infinity if TT tensorized with the identity satisfies GE K infinity for all gracial and tau. Then the result, which builds on all this previous work um, I've mentioned before. So there are similar results for manifolds and for graphs and finite dimensional QMS is if this lambda, this operator mean is the logarithmic mean then our gradient estimate G of K infinity satisfies the modified log Sobolev inequality. And the same result is then of course true for these complete, these tensorized versions with C's in front. Okay, now I gave you this new inequality G of K infinity told you it implies a well-known inequality. Of course, this is all not very interesting unless we can prove, at least in some cases, that this new inequality G of K infinity is satisfied. So let's look how we can do this. So let's see. 
and the right all the comments. So there's one basic thing how we deduce or one basic strategy how we deduce this gradient estimates which is going back to Eric and Jan already for finite dimensional ones. And this is a intertwining criterion. So if this TT intertwines with a semi-group TT vector, which satisfies some inequalities on H, then our TT satisfies GE of K infinity. And like this is somehow a version that has also been used by um, Hao Jen Li, Marius Junge, and Nicolas Raquente to define a Ritchie curvature bounds. And in some sense, um, so this theorem shows how these two approaches connect. So in their setting, I cannot explain all the notation now, but the experts will know. I can take TT vector as a semi-group formed this way, and then it satisfies the criterion of this result. And let me give you at least one example that's interesting to mathematical physics. If I have the hugh ornstein uhlenbeck semi-group in the borderline cases, limit cases, you get something like the fermionic uh, ornstein uhlenbeck semi-group this satisfies CGE of one infinity. So in particular, also this modified log sobolev inequality. Okay, but we can also go a little further. So one more property and the main reason why we introduce this CGE instead of GE only is that it's tensor stable. So now if I have two semi-groups that satisfy CGE of K infinity, then so does the tensor product and their free product. And another basic result, and here we go back to finite dimensional systems is if the generator TT has lint platform as double commutators, where the PJ are now commuting projections, then TT also satisfies CGE of one infinity. So let me also give you a half example of that. If I have a finite group, then it's a known result that all translation invariant QMS there are of this form just multiplication of lambda g by e to the minus norm of b of g squared, where b of g is a co-cycle. And then there's an explicit lint platform. Of course, these vj are commuting operators. They may or may not be projections. But for the example on the very last slide, they are. So let me go through this. Quickly, just a reminder on the group von Neumann algebra. And in our very specific case, if the group is the free group and I use L of G as the combinatorial distance of an element G of E. So in other words, this is just the number of letters of G if I write it as a word in the generators and their inverses, then it's known to, uh, due to Hager group that e to the minus L of G multiplication on this lambda G is a QMS. It's actually also tau symmetric. And how Nan and I were able to prove, and it was independently obtained by Brennan, Gao, and Junge, that this um, QMS satisfies the complete logarithmic Sobolev inequality with constant two, and this constant is actually optimal. And one can also note one more, not so quantum information, but classical geometrical corollary. This in particular means that the Poisson semi-group on the d-dimensional torus also satisfies CLSI with constant two. And now I think I'm at the end of my time. 
which is perfect point to stop here. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>